Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is eight o'clock and we're going to go ahead and call the meeting of the Durham Task Force on Recovery and Renewal to order. Uh, and I would ask if we could just take a moment this morning um, with everything going on in the world around us and in our community and the hurt that so many in our community are feeling and, and our hearts heavy, if we could just take a moment for reflection, please. Thank you for that. And as a reminder, our work of this task force is very much grounded in the framework of race equity and that perspective and that lens of race equity. So all that we do, we need to keep that in mind in our work. Uh, and with that, I will turn over to Mayor Shul and Chair Jacobs for their updates this week. Thank you, Katie, and good to see you. And thank you for opening us with that moment of reflection. We are in a very difficult time in Durham and in the world. Um, and it's unbelievable to me to think about how our world has changed, not just in the last few months, but just in the last week. And we all have to do everything we can to, kind of, to try to create the just society that we all want. And I, I'm, I'm proud that a lot of our work here and the work that you all have been leading on the task force has really been geared that way towards thinking about our vulnerable populations and thinking about equity uh, at the center of this work because we know that the virus affects different populations, uh, that, that the virus has attacked different populations because of the social inequalities that we have in our community and in our nation and in the world. Uh, so I'm very grateful for, to all of you all for keeping that in the forefront of our minds. I, I um, talked to Ryan um, earlier in the week about what to emphasize today uh, in introducing the meeting and it's really clear and it really relates to the things that we've already started the meeting talking about. And that is that, as you're going to hear from Rod uh, in a little while, <clears throat> our Latinx population is really bearing the brunt of the virus in Durham. And uh, so we're going to have that as an important focus of today's meeting. And I think that's something that we just have got to do everything in our power to take on in the immediate future. Whether, it's, whether we're thinking about education and advocacy, whether we're thinking about PPE, uh, whether we're thinking about our roundtables and how we're, and I, all this, some of this work has already been ongoing this week uh, with our construction roundtable, for example, to think about how we can better protect our Latinx neighbors from the virus. And so I, there are a lot of other things I could say today uh, about our work, and there's been some amazing work in this last week. I'm so impressed and so impressed with the work that everybody on this group has been doing. It's fantastic. Uh, but that's the one thing I really want to stick to that because I think that's, that's the thing that's really on my mind and on my heart. And I know that it is also for the rest of you. all. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll turn it over to Wendy. I'm sorry, everyone. I was having trouble getting into this meeting this morning, so I apologize. And I apologize not hearing what the mayor said. Um, but good morning, everyone. Um, good to see everybody this morning again. Um, <clears throat> and again, as always, thank you for the incredible work that everybody is doing. Um, I, I think when I, I don't know if the mayor said, said this, but um, it has been a pretty intense week. And so when I think about um, where we're at right now, um, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about it with a different perspective. Um, <clears throat>
So it looks like we have lost uh, Commissioner Jacobs. I thought it was my computer that had frozen up, but it may have been hers. Um, let's see if we can get her back on the line. Can you see me now? There we are. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Anyway, I, I just, um, it was hard to social distance. And I guess when I think about um, just, you know, COVID-19, I don't, I, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about how, how is this gonna impact? What are we gonna see in two weeks uh, with all, the, all of the um, protests? Um, I, I think that's for me is a big question mark uh, related to that. And then of course, with all the work that's happening in downtown with our businesses, um, I was glad to see this incredible um, artwork which is behind me right now last night on one of the the pieces of plywood boarding up uh, one of our businesses downtown but um, you know this was the week that uh, a lot of our downtown businesses were going to also try to reopen and move out onto the street so I just think now we have also another reality and I'm going to be looking forward to hearing what uh, Nicole and Susan and Jeff and, and all the folks working on the right revitalization um, what how this is going to impact the timeline of even people you know being able to move out onto the street and reopen um, and of course we've been incredibly fortunate in Durham that we've had peaceful protests because um, we've seen what's happened otherwise and that could really you know, have an impact on people uh, again reopening their business. So that that's really on my mind uh, right now. And the other issue I would just raise is that the numbers, and I'm looking forward to hearing Rod's report, um, are definitely increasing. And it it and I know the mayor was talking about the concerns about the Latinx community. We just lost our first child. Um, in, in Durham, uh, second grader Creekside, who is uh, his, you know, Latinx, Hispanic, and evidently her whole family is sick. Um, so, of course, really tragic that we have lost a child. Um, and I look forward to hearing from Pilar about that because I've been hearing things about related to that family. Um, and um, Great news about masks, which which I hope we'll hear more from folks about that. Great, great news about our capacity. All of a sudden, Jody I think knows about this, and Drew, and um, just the issue of homelessness. Again, I would like to hear from Drew about this today. Our uh, basically our contract runs out at the hotel where we have about 150 homeless people, July 1st. And so that's only a few weeks away. And right now we actually don't have a plan in place and we're only going to be able to be at half capacity for a homeless shelter. So that's a, a, a another thing that's really front and center for me. So again, a lot of important things to talk about uh, this morning with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Mayor Shul, Commissioner Jacobs, uh, great updates. Um, I will give just a brief update on the PPE. Um, so we had two meetings this week, two working groups that convened uh, to really look at plans for providing face coverings to both vulnerable populations and also increasing access to, to be able to purchase those face coverings for small businesses in our community. Um, We've actually got some very good news on this front. So we have, uh, Durham has secured more than $100,000 uh, in funding to provide free face coverings and we'll be distributing more than 40,000 of those starting this month. Uh, and then additionally, the county received more than 100,000, I think it was actually 112,000 face coverings this week. Uh, and so um, the Two teams are continuing to work, continuing to meet, uh, and really looking at how we can coordinate the distribution of these masks. Uh, and certainly I, in the, the 
group that met around vulnerable populations, really looking at there is a group called Cover Durham that has been doing a tremendous amount of work in this area um, and bringing that together to really coordinate that with the county uh, so that we have a very coordinated approach to this. So uh, more will be coming um, in the, the next week or so, um, but we're moving pretty quickly on this. I think that's good news. Matisha, did you have any updates for today? No, I don't have any additional updates, Katie. Okay, and I will ask Ryan to keep us on track here. Was there anything else that I was supposed to update on that I forgot to update on? No, that was good, thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, then with that, I will ask uh, Director Jenkins to give us an update on the key metrics as well as Dr. Akinboyo. Right, you're muted. One of these days I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> I apologize. Um, I start off saying good morning to everyone on the task force and I was saying that I echo uh, Commissioner Jacobs' uh, sentiments uh, on the death of the young Hispanic um, individual. And, um, you know, our hearts and mind goes out with the family. And um, it's, it's been a little tough on the public health staff and the work that we do because we are seeing such a heavy uh, increase in the Latinx community. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly taking a toll, but our work goes on and uh, we continue to do the great work of public health. So I'm going to provide you with some uh, key updates, uh, what I affectionately now call weekly reflection, data reflections for the week of June 1st, 2020. Uh, currently uh, within the United States, we're sitting at uh, 1,842,101 cases of COVID resulting in 107,029 deaths. Within the state of North Carolina, we're at 31,966 cases of COVID, resulting in 960 deaths. And in Durham, we're at 1,920 cases of COVID, resulting in 49 deaths. Um, as we always do, we recommend uh, going to the data hub. We continue to try to increase that and make it as transparent as possible and make it uh, Durham's source of uh, accurate factual information on all things COVID. We started off the week uh, with a total of 1,677 total cases. And this did represent a 348 uh, case increase from last week. So it's not an understatement to say that we, uh, we are seeing a heavy increase in our numbers. The uh, metric that's one metric that we came up with total, num total number of cases because the total number of cases helps our community to better understand the total disease burden within our community. And then we moved to the second metric was, which was the seven day average for the week. And we did see our seven day average move up dramatically. Um, two weeks ago, it was 20. Um, last week, it was 41. This week, we're seeing the seven day moving average be 51 total cases. And um, that certainly shows that there, uh, the trends in the disease prevalence is increasing within our community. Then I'd like to go toward uh, speaking about the month of May if I, if I can. The month of May saw significant increases in cases. There were a total of 882 new cases for the total month of May. So that's, uh, that's staggering. So again, it shows that um, coronavirus is not going away. It continues to uh, wreak havoc on, a, on our community. And uh, we're doing our very best to do our part to continue to promote awareness. As far as race, ethnicity, and work information, uh, we continue to promote health equity because we know that it's central to Durham County's uh, health department's values and also Durham County's values. And um, as it stands right now in the month of May, 
the most cases were among the Hispanic or Latinx individuals, and it represented 67%. And again, that's for the month of May. Uh, so suffice to say, the Hispanic or Latinx community were overrepresented because they represent 13.7 or roughly 14% of Durham County's residents. But then as far as COVID cases, they represented 67% of all of our cases. Within the Black or African American community, they were underrepresented for the month of May. Uh, they represent a total of 37% of Durham County residents, but for the month of May, their COVID-19 cases represented 19% of all cases. As far as white individuals, uh, they represent 54% of Durham County's total population, but for the month of May, they represented 12% of all our cases. And then we were proud to announce that we have reduced uh, the amount of missing data on rest, race and ethnicity. Hats off to our data analytics team for making sure that they uh, were able to properly identify all individuals. So we still are missing ethnicity for 5% of our cases, but that's certainly down from 17% in the month of April. Uh, so we continue to hone and work on our skills and make sure that we report the information as we receive the data. Continuing on with work, race, and ethnicity, and talking more or less about occupational community settings, it's important to understand these common workplace and congregate areas it's in terms of COVID-19 transmission, because they help us to target resources, ensure proper work, worker protections, and identify root causes for disparities. Again, talking about for the month of May, the greatest number of cases occurred among people working in construction, those who were unemployed, and those individuals working in nursing care facilities. A further breakdown, 91% of our cases were associated with construction work settings and were amongst the Hispanic or Latinx community, thus the need for um, the construction roundtable, which I'm certainly happy that we instituted that. 85% of our cases were unemployed and were also amongst the Hispanic or Latinx community per the data for the month of May. 65% of our cases were associated with nursing care facilities. And again, they were amongst the Black or African American community. And as Lois has asked last week, we are happy to provide some information about our efforts to curb that within long-term care and or nursing facilities. In terms of data distribution, um, adults were considered 18 years and older. Nursing care facilities, 72% of the residents, 72% uh, of positives were residents and 28% were staff. And adults 65 years and older were also listed as unemployed or were assumed to be retired. Continuing on with the data analytics, As far as our surveillance tracking, we want to indicate that we're, 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 we're continuing to um, track the prevalence of positive tests in insured populations and in community-based populations. Positive prevalence for uh, insured population rose from 9% to roughly 13% at the end of the week. Positive prevalence amongst community base rose from 9% to 19% by the end of the week. So we provide these estimates upon a weekly seven day moving average. Again, unless something has changed and Mayor Shul or Chair Jacobs has some updates for me, we do not have access to all negative tests completed in Durham County. I continue to hound the Department of Health and Human Services for this information, but I've not received it yet. So we don't want to indicate uh, you know, anything that may be misestimating. However, we do go by those, uh, those uh, tests that we have accurate information from, and that comes from Duke University Medical Center and Walgreens because we know the total number of tests and we also know the total number of positives.
I'm also proud to announce that on our data hub, we have uh, provided more information about how to locate a testing facility. And um, within the data hub, there are icons for either CVS or FastMed or Lincoln which shows like where they can go through geo mapping, exactly where to go to get their tests. And as some of you have also heard and what I've been talking about for the past couple of weeks, the state did do an announcement about the tools that our residents can use to further find and understand um, their symptoms and also where they can also get tested as well. So proud to announce that as well. At this time, that concludes my weekly briefing, more than happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Are there questions? I do have one question. Rod, thank you so much for the weekly reflection, reflections. I love the report. It's a lot of great information. Um, and I do understand that you just can't look at one item to draw conclusions. But you talked about the um, increase in cases over the past week. And as you said, it's a pretty large increase. It's about 20%, uh, a 20% increase over where we were. Is there anything that you are aware of that was unique to last week to cause this increase? I have taken hours upon hours to really um, quiz my surveillance team to pour over the data and to really take stock, Matisha, of all of our efforts and everything that we've done. And I, I really truly do believe that the results of our efforts to get the word out to our Latinx community is really paying dividends. Um, we are shouldering um, the burden on the back end, of course, with contact tracing and investigation. And that's what we do. But when I tell you that, when I look at the line lists and I look at the number of the names and the number of individuals that are coming, it's 85 to 90% Hispanic. And that's a fair and true, honest state. Um, the surveillance team, don't, they don't necessarily like me to be inside their space, but I'll go in there just to get a feel for what's going on and to really feel, you know, really give them support and just ask questions. And I was in there for several hours um, late yesterday evening, and this is what I'm seeing. Um, so I am forever um, grateful to Pilar and El Centro and El Futuro and um, the folks from La Ley, which is the Spanish language radio station, and all the things that I will be more than happy to detail as far as um, our efforts to get the word out later on inside the agenda. But um, the word is out and people are getting tested in droves. And that's a good thing because we want to know, we want them to know what their status is. We want them to get access to care as soon as possible. So um, I think that's where we are right now, Tisha. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rod, are we also seeing any increases in congregate living, uh, either between Butner or any of our skilled nursing facilities, or has that tapered off? That's a very good question, Katie, and that has presented um, somewhat of an anomaly because as Lois wanted information um, last week, and we're prepared to provide that to you today, um, congregate living was um, really giving us a run for our money, if you will, um, in, in weeks past, but it's sort of tapered off a little bit. We do have um, the presence of a few clusters Katie, and by that we mean um, there, there's several that we're really taking um, stock on or we're looking, we're looking at. Um, there was a, a couple of cases, this uh, couple of cases that we saw, particularly at um, during rescue mission and a couple of other places that we have, you know, been really um, keeping an eye on. But in terms of like massive outbreaks, Katie, in turn, um, in, in places and some of the long-term care facilities that we have in our community. Um, it's tapered off a little bit, but it's still, uh, it's still there. But um, we've not had, um, for example, we've not had a situation in which we had like 30 or 40 
in one facility. So I think I have some, some wood here. I'm just going to knock on wood that it continues to taper off a little bit. But, um, you know, we're fortunate that um, our efforts, which I will explain a little bit later on, are paying dividends as far as um, working with um, the many long-term care facilities, nursing facilities in Durham. Um, I think, you know, again, us having a presence on site, having a registered sanitarian and a public health nurse as a team, as a strike force, and providing that information from public health is really helping out. Excellent, thank you. Are there other questions? I, I have a question. Um, Rod, any, anything you're seeing with child care facilities as people are, are going back to work and, and more people are uh, using child care and also in terms of the contact tracing with Latinx, Hispanic community, maybe we'll hear more from this about Pilar, but uh, I know there have been challenges with people not necessarily wanting to share information. And is if you could talk about that, and and if we can't do the tracing adequately, can can we at least say to people, well, please tell everybody that you've been around for the last two weeks that you're positive, even if you won't tell us. Um, I, I just don't know how do you how do we approach these situations? So. Very good questions, Madam Chair. More than happy to expound on it. I'll take the second one first, if you don't mind. Um, as I said to Madam Chair and the Mayor earlier this week, it's not an issue of us having um, the right language spoken in order to do the contact tracing. We have the people and the capacity and the personnel. It's the trust. It's the people giving us the answers to help us box in the coronavirus in these communities. And um, sometimes um, it's, it, it's, it's frustrating to the surveillance staff to make the calls and to not get the answers that they need and to make another call and get the answer to one of the original calls. So it's quickly becoming, ladies and gentlemen, an investigation within an investigation. That's the best way to put it. Um, so we, we continue to do our best. We continue to get the word out to let them know that public health is governed by HIPAA and that their confidentiality is of uh, utmost importance and that we are professionals and we won't release their information, but we do need the names and contact information for those people who they, we consider to be close contacts. And um, it's not all doom and gloom. We are making some breakthroughs in terms of um, being able to get the information that we need. But some of it is like really um, coming as a result of us being in the same location, calling out information or names and somebody else say, oh, I just talked to that person or, or I, I know about that situation. So we continue to uh, do the very best we can with that. Um, I, I will have to um, exit this meeting a little early because we are um, proud to announce that we're finalizing the details on our CCNC contact tracers. Um, some of you on the call know that CCNC has had their challenges putting that platform together and getting that up and running. But, um, you know, again, I had to shake a few trees and really let them understand where Durham is. Um, when you have a day where you're having like 100 cases in one day, then that's, that, that's a call to action. And I don't care who I got to talk to. I was like, look, my folks need help. You guys promised us this. There are federal monies that came down for this. We really need for you all to assist us. So going back to question number one, Madam Chair, um, not too many issues with child care facilities. There was one that, um, that came on our radar that we knew of. And um, we, again, we just asked that they follow the protocols uh, they contact public health, and then we make sure that we guide them to uh, making sure that they do what they have to do. But there weren't, there were, there have not been too many, maybe two. Rod, can you shine a little more light on uh, and give us some insight into the unemployment percentages? I think you mentioned that 85% of the cases uh, were uh, unemployed. Um, that just baffles me. 
Um, I do a little. I do a little bit, Mr. Nelson, but um, it, it's important that I give that clarification. A lot of the cases again involve the Latinx community, and a lot of the positives are family members, particularly spouses, and the majority of them, Mr. Nelson, are unemployed. So again, they, they are listed as a positive, but they are in fact unemployed. And in addition to that, um, those individuals in congregate living facilities who are 65 years and older, we, we have no other choice but to make the assumption that they are either retired or they are unemployed. So that's, that's what the data is really saying. So um, sorry, we're lumping uh, retired, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're lumping retired and unemployed together. Is that correct? For the purposes of our data collection, yes, sir. Okay. I, I want to say one real quickly on that. I think um, my understanding of what Rod said, and Rod, you can correct me, is that it's not that 85% of the cases are unemployed, and Rod, correct me, it's that 85% of our of the cases of people who are unemployed are Latinx. Is that correct, Rod? That's correct. And again, um, it's important for me to also note that that was for the month of May. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Rod, mm -hmm. Rod um, I would like to, if we can have a conversation later on about the tracing and the phone calls, because I had a a lady who called me and she was feeling very uncomfortable um, actually giving the information and receiving so many calls and why do they need her kids' names and she already gave it to somebody else and she said, I'm not going to answer anymore the telephone. What do you think? And I said, you need to give it. It's a way I can explain everything. But if we can have a conversation to see how we can help on that because sure. definitely it's a trust issue and how so if we can have a, a conversation later on. To, to absolutely, Pilar. absolutely, Pilar, and thank you for that information because um, the one thing that I have learned is that um, in, in my um, communications with um, the Latinx advocates and um, public health or, or healthcare advocates, it's um, sometimes the messaging and the, the way that we deliver the information may need to change in order to establish a, a certain comfort level. So I'm more than happy to have that conversation with you and I thank you. Thank you. And just a quick comment, we run into some of the same issues here where we have patients that are positive being contacted by their provider research team and then somewhat of the internal contact tracers just to figure out where they went. And I think a slight update that may have made a difference is at the time of testing, ensuring that people know they will be contacted if they're positive. And it's more for their safety, safety of the family and their local community. It didn't fix all the issues, but it may help just ensuring that at the time of testing, the same way we do with a lot of tests, you will be contacted to discuss your results, but to also ask you about where you've been for the last two days. That's great, thank you. So this is actually, I think, a really good segue point into talking about um, what additional steps we need to take to really help reduce the spread in our Latinx community. Um, we've heard the numbers. We, we know uh, we have a significant challenge here and really want to, to get our arms wrapped around this. Um, so Pilar, do you want to start us off? Yes, thank you, um, Kate, and thank you everybody for, uh, and the mayor and the commissioner for putting this uh, important place in the agenda and for everybody. Um, we've been having different meetings and a lot of conversations uh, with different groups and even people from this task force. Uh, first, identifying probably what are the barriers for our community or the issues we see. Uh, and of course, one of the main um, we've seen is people don't want to say they are sick if they are starting feeling sick because they need to work, they need, they need the, to get the money. So they don't say it, they don't tell anybody and they go to work even if they have some symptoms. Um, the other thing is, um, I think the masks is an issue. I don't think it's a big issue, but we, we still need to, come, to work on that. 
Um, in some places we see if they are the only ones using the masks and others are not using it or um, at the stores or other places they feel it's not, recommend, it's not mandatory. I think that's the, probably the word, but they feel why they need to use it. Um, also, we talked about how to work in certain uh, places with the mask on, how comfortable or uncomfortable it is. Uh, the other thing I gather is um, people and contractors and other people feel that because restaurants are opening and other things are opening means we don't have to worry as much as we had to worry before. Uh, so they are relaxing um, the recommendations uh, we put out there. Uh, even, you know, using the mask or cleaning everything, uh, wiping with Clorox or uh, using the masks or washing hands or distancing. So I think we need to continue uh, working on that. Um, some people uh, don't want to share with others uh, that they are sick uh, because they feel rejected. So uh, last week I helped a lady who, um, the lady who called me for this and she said, I don't want anybody to know because then they will feel uh, we are not desirable to be around or the neighbors will look at us and, and in a strange way. So we don't want anybody to know that we are sick. So I think that's a problem also with uh, the tracing. Um, the other um, issue we are seeing is in construction, mainly people traveling together to the working site. So uh, what would do we do about it? Um, and also some of the employers, uh, the contractors, they feel they are following the recommendations and they um, try to do everything at the work site, but they, they feel that the, over the weekend, the workers relax and they share with other people and then they come on Monday, um, you know, with no following the recommendations during, during the weekend. Uh, I'm going to mention some of the things uh, we know are happening already, the efforts that um, everybody's doing right now, and probably I'm missing some, but I try to make a summary. So we know the health department has been doing a lot of work, um, having videos in Spanish uh, for the community, the flyers, actually, I received a good flyer yesterday from Alicia about um, the new uh, COVID fact sheet. And I was happy to see also that they included in the symptoms that they losing the smell and the taste because that's the other thing I've been hearing in, Latin, in the Latinx community. A lot of them, they don't have fever when they start getting sick. They just feel a little, um, no, no, not very sick, but a little, but mainly they don't, they can't smell anything or taste anything. So that's in the new flyer. So I think that's very important. Um, I, you may, so a cover Durham is connecting with um, different Latinx outlets, talking, you know, Futuro, La Superior, the Credit Union, um, another church giving masks. So we know um, that's going on, giving masks to, to the community. Um, we at the Central bought some masks from people from the community who makes them. Um, and we've been distributing those masks, but also with them, we are planning on having some Facebook Lives, uh, them explaining why they decided to make these mas masks and why it's important to use them and give recommendations. So it's not again us, a Central or the a health department telling them, but it's their own community or their neighbors or their friends or family members. Um, and then we are forming the Immigrant and Refugee Roundtable. Um, so I, we will start next week, meeting next week, early next week. So other ideas we've been uh, gathering for how to work on this. Uh, distribute masks in the neighborhoods, Latinx neighborhoods, but including educational materials. Um, I believe if we don't include these materials, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, we don't do anything really giving the masks because we, that doesn't assure they are going to use them. So we need to really include uh, these materials. Um, I would say we need to be very specific, uh, try to, um, be specific in depending of the sectors. So if you're in construction, if you're painting, if you're working inside, outside, gardening, or uh, other places, so they know if you are driving 
with somebody else because it's the only way of transportation? What are the measures you need to take um, to do that? So we need to be very specific in that material um, with giving it with the masks. Also, um, we think it's better to give some of the cloth masks um, so because I think it's better for them to, it's, it's easier to breathe with those. Um, and also um, talk, work with uh, contractors um, about signage um, of all the recommendations they need to follow, um, insist that they have to repeat every day to their workers uh, the recommendations. So I think we need to work closer to the contractors and also the workers, of course, the community members. Um, another idea um, that came up was provide some stickers uh, that communicate um, about wearing masks to protect your family with the hard hats. Um, what else have I here? Um, again, I said with the uh, printing material. Also um, important developing a communications campaign with the Spanish media. I've been, um, we've been meeting with um, newspapers, radio, TV in Spanish. And we are working in, um, in, in this communications campaign. But I would like to see how we can really um, centralize or, um, I don't know the best word to use, but because I feel we are doing so many different things in this area. Um, and I think, the, you know, the resources in time and, and money and people um, are not a lot. So how we can capitalize in what everybody's doing and trying to, and also I think that, that will give to the, give to the community, sorry, um, a unified message and really they know this is what I need to listen and everybody's saying the same thing, no different messages because I think that that's also confusing for the community. So I, I will want to hear some something about that. Um, when we talk about the, um, creating uh, about testing. Um, so I talked to Rod and feel about the idea of probably uh, helping with some testing uh, with our mo mobile unit, but we haven't finalized that, um, that conversations because at, at what we know probably is enough testing. What we don't know is how our community feel about it, but hearing from Rob seems like our community is really coming forward. Uh, to the testing places, but we don't know if um, about trust, if will help, if uh, somehow we are involved in that, but we can continue talking about that. Um, and the other thing we talked um, was about, uh, what, another thing we think is people, if they feel sick, they still need to go out get food for their families so they don't send anybody but they go to the supermarket and other places so how we can if we can start a campaign or something um this similar of what we are doing with the positive covid um that when they are sick they contacted i know the county has a program we have also a program they can contact us and we will bring them food um, we buy some groceries for them and the medicines and deliver to their home. So if we could do that, if you feel sick, if you have these symptoms, um, how we can help you bring in to you um, the food or whatever you need so it, you don't have to go out uh, while you get, get tested. Um, so that's something I think um, I, I would like to see if we, can, we are able to do some of these. Um, and something very important in all the work, and I think the mayor mentioned this at the, at the beginning of the meeting, is um, really to implement a commitment to two-way communication on the part of the city and county agencies staffing hotlines and service windows with Spanish fluent representatives who can respond in a real time. Um, I think this, this can also be helped along with that um, we mentioned having Spanish speakers represented in uh, the different round tables. I think that's also very important and including in all round tables, um, people from our community. Uh, yesterday I connected um, 
Brian with uh, a lot of the realtors um, uh, that are Latinos so they can know all the information but also give their ideas uh, how really to work with our community. Um, simultaneous um, also um, full and accurate Spanish translation of key, key resources, print and online, and also released at the same time as we release the English resources. Uh, I think that's important too. Um, and we've been talking uh, with Tilde about this and um, language justice. Um, also uh, simultaneous interpretation at any task force meetings where key information is shared with the public at large and Spanish dubbing of videos and other recorded announcements released at the same time as English recordings. Um, and also um, only to acknowledge that language access goes beyond Spanish English and even in the Latinx community there are many indigenous languages speakers that go unnoticed. So probably just mentioning that fact might help uh, people to feel included um, in this uh, in this work so that's what I have so I would like to see uh, if we can have um, I don't know if people have questions or a conversation about how we can really implement some of the um, ideas or if people have over other ideas but I think this is urgent um, at least for, for, and I know for everybody and for us at El Centro is one of the priorities and we've been working hard on this, but we need also the support of everybody and see what others think and can propose. I have, I have a question, Pilar. Uh, thank you. It's, it's, it's just disheartening to hear um, the, the, these, these effects and implications, but also, I didn't. I didn't. I was listening intently, trying to hear whether or not you were going to point out some things that other communities could do to help the Latinx community. Obviously, you know, it's, it, uh, it's a sad reminder that many of us have have, uh, have suffered within our own communities for uh, for, for 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 centuries, uh, looking for help and not expecting help. So, it, it, are there things that the Black community and the and the, and the business community also could do that that you hadn't put on the table? that could help alleviate some of the some of the tentacles from uh from COVID-19 in the Latinx community? Thank you Ed. Um, so I think I think helping uh with all the messaging um all over and not only to our community but to other community members and I guess businesses um, because a lot of them have contact with our community members so I think with the messaging uh, that could help and also I would say if we could implement uh, some of, you know, like the um, program helping bring in food to the people, if we can get volunteers, that, that will be helpful. Um, and about that, you know, I was thinking a lot about that piece because we always say, oh, people feel more comfortable um, seeing, you know, Spanish speakers, but we are talking about people who are sick and what we do, we don't have contact with people. We just leave the groceries and then we let them know we just deliver uh, the groceries or clothing, whatever they need at your door. So I think that that could be really helpful. Uh, and I guess um, we have some uh, funding, but I think even funding to buy the food or the things people need, I think that's the other um, piece. Pilar, if, if people are interested in helping with funding, does, do they make a donation through El Centro? Is that the best way or is there are there other ways to help with funding yes so we we have a fund an emergency fund and we've been helping uh, people through that fund with food so yeah that could be i can share the the link that would be great thank you pilar what about sick leave um i paid sick leave i think about people going to work because they feel they have to work but if they had paid sick leave it would help the employer because their other other employees are not getting sick and it would help the employee. And I wondered about what the status of paid sick leave is. I, I assume that means that a lot of people don't have it. And I, I wondered what uh, our business community could do uh, 
in response to that, I was thinking about the construction roundtable and uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the other industries that you mentioned. Um, could we do some work on that? And I'd be interested in our, in hearing from our, our, some of our business representatives here um, about that too. What are your thoughts, Pilar? Yes, thank you for um, asking that. And I forgot to uh, say that because uh, one, at least I was able to talk to one company yesterday and they, that's what they are doing after they got their first case. Um, because what they are saying is if you feel sick, don't come to work, get tested. And if you get tested and you're positive, we will cover two or three weeks while you recover. So you don't have to worry. So you people can tell us. And as you said, it, they don't, um, con, they, oh my gosh, I don't know how to say this. Yeah, they don't bring it to the work site. Yes. So, um, but I, I'm not sure this is happening in all the companies. This is, I was very surprised uh, this person told me that. So I think that will be really helpful because that will help really um, to alleviate this and people will be more for coming saying, I'm not feeling very well, I'm having these symptoms uh, and then pushing them to get tested. So they, because also, even though testing I know is going up, um, I had a conversation with, a, with another lady that they, um, I think the, her sister, her husband, her brother-in-law was positive. So she told her sister to get tested and the kids and they weren't sure they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. They better take some um, vitamin C and some food that will help them. And finally they didn't get tested even though I pushed for that. So I think, um, but I think that will help a lot because they don't feel that I have to go because I need to provide. So um, just a kind of a wild idea thought, kind of pulling from, um, you know, Ed's point about how different communities might also be able to support, knowing that, you know, not all employers are able to offer sick leave, um, particularly some small businesses that are already really struggling financially. I, I'm just curious if there's any, or if there has been ever um, efforts to, I know that within a single business, um, there are sometimes opportunities where somebody who has sick leave that doesn't need it can give it to a coworker that doesn't, that sort of doesn't have it. And I'd be curious if there's ever been any sort of more community-wide efforts around that. Um, obviously, we would need to get some of the large employers in the area uh, on board where, for example, as a, as a, you know, where, you know, potentially Duke employees who don't need their, their sick leave uh, can, can gift some to a, another business uh, to be able to pass along. And so just kind of throwing out a, a wild idea, um, but another way that different communities might be able to help support uh, that aspect of it. That's actually a really interesting idea. I hadn't thought about that, but I wonder if we could get traction on it. What would be some next steps, Katie, do you think that would maybe help us think about that? How, who would have to get together and maybe Jeff can, can uh, That's have some ideas maybe, about that. Yeah, Jeff, because um, it, it would really be the business community largely. Certainly I can have some discussions here at Duke and see whether there ever would be that opportunity. Um, and I, don't I think it's certainly, it's certainly worth a conversation. I'd be more than happy to reach out to some of our larger employers. I don't know how that would necessarily work. Um, if I'm understanding the, the question, um, how would a larger employer uh, gift sick leave hours to maybe some of the, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see how that would, would work, but maybe it's certainly worth the conversation. These are extraordinary times, so I'd be happy to, to reach out and have some of those um, at least discussions if there's a way to do that. And, and Pilar, please share that uh, your link with us. I know that um, we'd love to share with our network um, and, and make sure that we can uh, push that opportunity out. Um, our corporate partners um, have uh, so far um, have, have stepped up for, for the community um, and supported a number of different either nonprofits or um, or other uh, funding mechanisms to, to assist. And so I know that there, there'd be an interest in doing that for you all as well. So please do share that. And I will have some conversations 
um, additionally with some of our large employers to see what what that could possibly look like. Um, sure. Yeah, and I'll I'll look as well. I don't know exactly what it could look like, um, although it could be as simple as um, you know take away the sort of PTO piece of it or, or paid time off and and look at just do we do we set up a fund that that could be established through El Centro or somewhere else that could be used to help provide some financial support for those employees. Um, yeah, Katie, that was that was along the lines that I was thinking is that, you know, it's it is a budget line item, you know, benefits and including sick leave is a budget line item for businesses. And so if employees sort of surrender some of their sick leave that I imagine that there could be some sort of a ca like a cash calculation on the business. But I don't I don't work in HR. I don't know the the calculations behind it. No. And that essentially would then become a donation to a community based sick leave. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I think it's worth exploring. So maybe Jeff and I can work offline on that. Yeah, and I and I would suggest that you know the uh, donating uh, vacation or sick because traditionally some employers do not allow you to donate sick, but they do allow you to donate vacation. Great point, Lois. This is Wendy, and I apologize. I'm on my way to a doctor's appointment, and that's why I'm have uh, exited out of my video, but. Um, Pilar, that was a fantastic report, and you really, I think, gave us an incredible amount of insight into a lot of the issues, and I think um, what I hear people doing is trying to respond to, um, the, uh, you know, the issues that have been raised, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to come up with a plan that tries to address all of the various issues that Pilar has, has raised. Um, and. I'm just wondering about the construction roundtable, which just had its first meeting, and if we could hear what were what came out of that in response to this um, this need, and you know what what are they doing? What are they willing to do? And even around this whole issue of of sick paid sick leave, uh, if that was that anything that was discussed. So that's a great segue right into our roundtable updates. And let's start with construction. I will mention we do have a meeting, I think, on Tuesday afternoon of the action team focused on our work for um, our traditionally underserved uh, communities. And so we'll have a lot more, I think, uh, as we continue this work. But let's turn it over to Brian to give us a, a roundtable update. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for uh, all the work you're all doing for our community. Um, to get right into the uh, construction utilities roundtable, uh, there's certainly recognition across the industries and by uh, the employers that this is a issue that they're um, focused on for the, the short term and the long term um, on behalf of uh, their work and their employees. And there did start to be some really good conversation between different entities, particularly uh, some of the, the uh, umbrella organizations like the Home Builders Association about ways that uh, everyone can work together to support one another. Um, I don't want to say that there's some back and forth uh, on uh, what the specific uh, next steps are going to be in terms of what's being pushed out to um, the sites and to actually who's, who's delivering that information. Um, but I do think that largely there's been a lot of good um, best practices out there uh, by local, state, and uh, national groups to try to influence the work of this sector. Um, but it is coming down to uh, what's, what happens on the ground. Um, I think there's also a, a important clarification that the work, I think employers and particularly some of these construction sites recognize that um, while they could be a, they are a place where people are gathering uh, in to do the work that some of the 
data maybe reflects that these in people who are contracting diseases, these are their occupations. Um, can you, uh, I hate to put uh, Director Jenkins on the spot, but could you clarify really quickly, does, through the contact tracing, obviously, some of the work goes back to where individuals have been, but does the data show where the transmission occurs, or does it just show the occupation of the person? In most cases, it shows the occupation. It doesn't necessarily show where it occurs. So we, in turn, um, through our questioning, that's where we determine exactly where um, most of their time was spent. But uh, it just asks what their occupation is. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to put that out there to um, help us understand the connection between everything we were just talking about and the uh, industry-specific conversations broadly is that um, there's a great recognition by both sides of the need to uh, support the work that happens in the community outside of um, the, what happens on the work site. And so I think there's some really creative ideas that uh, have started uh, coming up about public-private partnerships. Um, and a lot of these systems have been in place in the past. Uh, the public uh, sector work that supports these industries um, it tends to it tends to be good two-way communication to try to uh, work together on regulation and uh, best practices and so uh, I, I think you'll see some specific next steps moving forward from that but uh, it's certainly important for us to get our uh, all of our people together from uh, all sides of the issues um, I'm happy to take some uh, some other questions about specifics that are coming out of roundtables, but I would, before giving a, a little bit more general update, um, I, I'm sorry, Mayor and Chair Jacobs, to kind of put you all on the spot, but can can I get can we give ourselves and and the rest of our community just a quick reminder on how you are currently receiving the regular public health updates and then making decisions about. Uh, how the task force and others can help make decisions about um, safer at home orders and uh, other public messaging on uh, on community priorities. Sure, uh, we we get uh, now a weekly update from Rod uh, in the MAC call, which is on uh, which is the multi agency call. Uh, which is through the emergency operations center and that's on Wednesdays now uh, we've moved to once a week. Uh, we get the, the, the kind of information, the detail that um, Rod gave earlier, we get. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of constant updating on the data hub. So we feel like we have a lot better uh, data uh, uh, constantly um, that Rod and his team have put together. Um, in terms of, I'm not sure exactly the import of your question, Ryan, around the orders, but we're not, uh, we are, there's the only, um, I would say the only thing that we're hearing now locally uh, from industry is from the real estate industry around open houses. Uh, they had um, met this week and I was expecting actually to get something from them, haven't yet. Uh, but but uh, other than that, we haven't really been, I, I haven't been hearing, and I don't think Wendy has either from other specific industry groups that are, that, that are unhappy with our local order. There's still a lot of, you know, the gyms and the bars are really dealing at the state level with what the uh, restrictions are. I do think the other thing that I've heard is that because the gyms are restricted from, uh, you know, the, I've heard, I, I got a, a one email, uh, actually it was through George of, uh, from a gym owner concerned about the limit on outside uh, mass gatherings because they want to have more people uh, working, you know, exercising outside. So I guess that's the other thing that I've heard. Um, I don't know, does that sure. answer your question? Can I just it, jump it in? It does. I, I just, I gotta, I'm gonna have to run into this appointment. The other thing is we get epidemiological um, modeling data as well um, every week from Duke. I just wanted to mention that. That's another important source of information for us. 
well, th thanks for those uh, reminders of how you are uh, regularly thinking about it and making these decisions. Um, the uh, real estate services did get together this week and they have developed some voluntary self-certification um, ideas that uh, I know are, are under consideration now. Um, and, uh, but I think broadly there's been some conversation, the fitness centers also uh, got together this week about uh, how to just understand the, the process of decisions being made moving forward uh, as we potentially move, the, the state potentially moves into a new phase or there's updated public health guidance and things like that. Um, you're right, uh, Mayor, that the gyms uh, are among those who received updated public health guidance from the state this week on outdoor fitness activities. And in general, the, the reason that I, I'm asking about the decision-making process is, and, and the public um, communication of that is there's some recognition of the difference between public health uh, updates that are coming out and then what's written into the order. And while everyone is, the community is generally interested in uh, uh, certainly abiding by everything uh, that we are doing locally, um, the, the types of questions that I think uh, outdoor fitness and, and others are getting are uh, along the lines of the state has a, a number out there. We locally have a, a number out there. Um, I, I want to feel safe. The uh, customers want to feel that they, uh, the information that's coming out from uh, the city and county is affirming what uh, they think is, is important uh, for their customers as well. And so I do think that it's important for the work to move to get ahead on um, the voluntary self-certification program. Yeah, well, let me just comment on that. Um, you know, we're the the um, we you know our orders always lag the public health guidance. The public health guidance comes out, and then we revise our orders accordingly. Um, and um, so uh, especially now, I mean, at the very beginning, we were all making a lot of very, you know, quick, difficult decisions with very incomplete information. We have much better information now. It's a very different process, that, thank goodness. Um, but we're, the reason that we have, as you mentioned, the, 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 the roundtables and the self-certification is that for people to bring to us, you know, if, if I'm wide open uh, to, as, as I've told the real estate people, I know Wendy is as well, um, bring us your bring us your safe practices uh and your and your voluntary self-certification around the around the real estate business and we're you know very happy to modify moder you know modify our our uh, order similarly with the uh with the gyms if they're outdoor safe practices and they want to bring those to us and they think our limit is too low i mean the, the two areas where we are different from the state the three areas where we're significantly different from the state is one is the 10 limit on the mass gatherings Two is the uh, no real estate roundtables and I'm sorry, no real estate uh, open houses. And the third, of course, is the uh, face coverings. And so if those two industries have, uh, you know, bring us the self-certification, the voluntary self-certification and the, and the safe practices, we're, we're happy to, to uh, take all that in and, and, and modify our order accordingly. I think that is the point of the roundtables, right? Really yeah. is, is to be able to get that from from the industry experts and then pair that with any guidance from public health and uh, and, and certainly Dr. Akinboyo uh, also provides that epidemiologic and, and infection prevention guidance as well um, and, and pair that together so that we can advise uh, this task force with the roundtables can advise Mayor Shule and Commissioner Jacobs, so. Sure, well, uh Thanks for all those uh, clarifications, and uh, I do think, in general, there's been additional up, uptick of uh, our community's participation in the Count on Me NC program as one uh, way that people can signal that. Um, but uh, we did have some good conversation, and I know there's some things moving forward. Uh, I don't want to take anything away from a later 
uh, item on uh, the the local voluntary self certification process that uh, folks are coming up with, but a lot of roundtables are uh, are developing that guidance and are looking forward to uh, integrating it into the programs that are presented. Um, I'll note that there are uh, additional roundtables that have uh, started to meet. Um, we have plans now for sports and recreation entertainment and cultural venues, parks, outdoor events, and festivals, and several others to get together. And uh, that'll certainly be important as we recognize uh, others may be moving uh, around us into different phases of uh, what's going on at the state level. And there is, in general, uh, this continued conversation about resources. I think there's been some really good progress made locally on some financial resources, um, but there is continued interest in uh, what does PPE uh, supply look like locally for folks. And so we're glad that there's great work going on uh, around the task force on that. Um, we have had really good public support in uh, from both the health side and the uh, the permitting and, and regulation side on trying to get direct answers to individual roundtables. And so we had a great one on restaurants this week. Um, and I'd love to give uh, Susan and Nicole uh, the opportunity if you've got any specific takeaways uh, from those. I'll also ask for uh, anything from the barbershops, salons, and personal services that Ed and I uh, held yesterday afternoon. And I uh, certainly want to hear from Dr. Davis about places of worship. Uh, but I do want to give the opportunity if there are specific other uh, questions or thoughts um, and want to say a big thank you. Uh, Ms. Rosha Goldberg did mention earlier that uh, she had connected uh, the realtors with from different communities together, and uh, we are appreciative of, of her doing that and looking to do as much outreach to make uh, all of our roundtables uh, representative of the different industries that we're working on. So, um, yeah, I'll kind of open it up to those uh, roundtable leaders that uh, have met with this week. Well, I'll jump in here and talk a little bit about restaurants and jump in also about the parts that she is an expert on. I think there are uh, two uh, areas that they spent a lot of time talking about. Um, the big piece is that they're waiting for the restaurant bill um, to clear. Uh, it's waiting right now. It's been passed by the House and Senate and is in the uh, governor's lap right now. There's a lot of speculation back and forth, it seems, about whether he will not sign it or whether we don't know what will happen to it. So um, that has a lot of implications for restaurants and, uh, about the degree to which they can expand outdoors. And so they're very interested in that. I think another issue, of course, is the fact that for our downtown restaurants, many of those are boarded up and there's discussion going on about uh, when it might be people will feel safe to take the um, plywood down. Uh, I think that'll have a a uh, huge positive impact, and uh, I know Nicole's um, advocated for that happening as quickly as possible, um, but I think it will depend on when people feel comfortable doing that. Um, and uh, the, I know there's, Nicole can speak to all the work that they're doing on how we would provide for outdoor seating space um, for the restaurants. Um, and there's one more piece, and I'll turn it over to her, one more piece that uh, happening, which is still a lot of discussion about uh, the level of support that the restaurants might be able to get from the city and the county in the way of um, funding. Uh, and there's a meeting that happens after this one where they're gonna, I think they're going to talk further about that. So Nicole, fill in all the gaps I left. Morning, everybody. Um, we are watching with great interest what happens at the state level with this ABC board, uh, bill. Um, would be great if we could get that through. Uh, as a lot of the downtown restaurants have said, serving outside would be, I won't say pointless, but 
they, they really would like the opportunity to expand how they can serve alcohol when they're also serving food. Uh, so this has slowed us down a, a little bit. Uh, and my hope is that the, our state politicians will do what's best for our economy and, and push that through. Um, but we're, we're waiting to hear. Around the downtown area and the outdoor eating, um, we continue to work with the city. Uh, we had a great meeting last week with the planning department, transportation, parking, um, uh, public health, and uh, general services. I mean, I know that they've had internal meetings. That is moving forward. Uh, we have come up with a layout that seems to work, um, that, that should be able to work for most of the downtown businesses. And again, I can, I can only speak to the work that we're doing within um, the downtown area from Golden Belt to East Campus and the old ballpark to 147. So just so everyone knows the area that we're very focused on. Um, with a concentration in the loop uh, where most of our restaurants are, but certainly not all of them. Uh, so we, we continue to work. Uh, the city has what we have provided and they're putting together the guidelines. Um, we're now in the space of trying to find resources for the restaurants so when they open they don't have to buy or, or go out and try to find this so we're going to start reaching out to our partners at the city and the county to see if we can find barriers uh, especially for anyone that is using a parking space uh, so that we can protect uh, folks sitting in parking spaces from um, traffic at this time we're not actively uh, supporting or I shouldn't say pushing for closures, closures of roads, uh, complete streets. Uh, we have considered and we are talking with the city about maybe closing some lanes at very specific times of the day, uh, but recognizing that a lot of our streets are used by buses and delivery and just people who are coming back to work, so not wanting to impact any of those individuals. Um, so it's, it's growing. I, I think we're very close to, to something that, that we should be ready to roll out, um, but we were trying to address just these, these last little, little issues. Uh, anyone on the call who has access to barriers, chairs, tables, tents, umbrellas, who would be willing to offer these to the businesses, either at a very significant reduced rate or just because you want to support the opening of the restaurants, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can send your information to me and I will pass it on to uh, Rachel Wexler, who is doing a lot of the work on, on DDI's behalf on this. But we are actively looking for those, those things now. Um, that is an additional cost that uh, the businesses recognize and are, are trying to figure out how best they could do it. Um, and it is too great of a cost for us to do alone, uh, DDI to do alone. And um, finally, I will say that um, we, we did watch the city council meeting yesterday and the conversation around the small businesses. And um, we recognize, since we're talking about restaurants, that the way that is currently structured with a limit of 25 will impact quite a few of our downtown restaurants who have more than 25 employees. Um, so I would imagine that that will come up in today's conversation that starts at 10 o'clock um, because they too were watching that. Um, so we will report back what we hear, um, but we appreciate all of the work of the city and the county. Uh, we appreciate that there is a small business uh, assistance program that it has been crafted and does seem to be moving. Uh, and we look forward to pushing that out to all of our businesses in support. Um, and um, I will throw out there that, and, and Brian, I think I sent you a text, but I will throw out there that the retail businesses are asking when there will be a retail roundtable. So um, they see that the restaurants are getting a, the attention, and, and we hear this quite often, restaurants get the attention, what about um, the others? Uh, so um, I'm happy to work with you, Ryan, uh, Brian, on trying to set up a retail roundtable, uh, recognizing that there are a number of retail restaurants outside of our downtown, but that is something that I'm hearing probably from the majority of our retail businesses now, that they are anxious and would like to have a conversation around that. Noticing that many sure. are opening, open and are, are operating under the 50% with the uh, social distancing and, and trying to make sure that they are only allowing the, the, the maximum number of people within their spaces. Sure, and there have been some conversations uh, among uh, the industry, but we 
had not done a, a formal roundtable, and so we'll uh, look to do that next week. Um, it is one of the industries that is uh, somewhat covered by the Count on Me and C training, um, and so I think they'll be anxious to see what that uh, local complement to that is uh, to be able to help them and uh, their customers. Um, Thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure I hadn't missed, it, missed an email. I was really concerned that I had missed an email, so. <laughs> no, you're fine. And th thanks to everyone. Uh, we are looking to uh, refine the process uh, so that it's a, a little bit easier to plug in for yourselves and um, for our businesses uh, for the short term and long term. Um, I do think uh, there's going to be an opportunity to uh, have some of this work uh, expand beyond the the task force uh, generally, you know, a lot of these sectors had already had some informal meetings and some formal meetings before this. Um, some have expressed a desire to continue it beyond, you know, the immediate uh, recovery need. And I think that there's some, uh, several organizations represented here and, and otherwise that uh, will help play that role. Uh, but I also think it's been great for those that maybe only had convened via a Facebook group in the past uh, to uh, have some, some formal structure and uh, be able to uh, have their thoughts and, and voices heard. So um, I do want to give an opportunity for uh, Mr. Boyd and uh, for Dr. Davis uh, on some of the specific roundtables they were in, but I also know we need to move on. Uh, just quickly, I, I think we were, Brian and I were, were admonished yesterday by the massage therapist uh, that wanted to make sure that we mentioned that uh, they had been reading a lot of uh, massage, uh, verbiage around massage parlors, and they wanted to make sure that we understood that they were not parlors and that they were actually therapists, and they would prefer that that, that verbiage is corrected. Um, so I just want to put that out. Uh, the personal services, barbershops, beauty salons, uh, I think it was nails and anesthetists, anesthetician, excuse me. Um, there, there's, a, there's still a lot of concern because none of them actually have statewide, uh, uh, are getting good statewide guidance. They're, also, they're, they're all led by statewide licensing boards, but they don't feel like there's an adequate uh, information given to, a, to them. And just the sheer nature of all of their businesses goes directly against every recommendation that's being put out that tells us how to prevent ourselves from, from, from contact, contracting COVID-19 and from spreading it. Uh, the other thing I think, and it's just to, to, to the last point, because uh, one of the uh, one of the business owners downtown, actually, I think she was downtown or, or Bradley Square, uh, actually was was concerned and 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 wanted an update on some of the uh, black barbershops that had mentioned on the first call, kind of what they were going through. Uh, we've kind of seen a a, a, a similar a, a relative drop off uh, in participation on, on fr from them as well on the roundtable. But there was a huge concern just in the, in, the, in that in that community in the community because. You're talking about a business that it's really getting in upwards of 85 to 90 percent of their revenue generated from the exact same community. And so with that community also being adversely affected by the by the uh, by unemployment, there's this trickle down effect of these businesses uh, that, that is devastating. And one of them. Uh, uh, Mr. Lynn Lilly, uh, uh, who owns, who's, who's been a barber since 93, I think he said he had a barbershop on West, the West End, um, just mentioned how the importance that he felt he served for so long in, in the community of not just being a barber, but just being a, you know, almost a counselor and a, and a, and a leading figure in, in the community. And that, you know, he had been spending a lot of time just texting clients and, and, and people in the community just trying to keep updates. Uh, I think Brian can, you know, attest to this. There seemed to be a, a, a lot of, I don't know, I, just, I felt some, some hopelessness there um, um, from, from, from some of them. Uh, a lot of them, you know, obviously are husbands, fathers, leaders of families, and, and have been providers, you know, for years and are, are just at a, at a crossroads. And I, I don't know if Task Force has answers. I know I didn't have answers, um, but I definitely wanted to, I mean, they, 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 they stepped out of a comfort zone enough to, to share, share that. Uh, so I definitely want to present that in, in, a, in as public a form as possible. And then I'll, I'll, I'll take off. 
Brian, this is Lois. I just want to ask a quick um, question, and that is to what degree at these round tables are, are folks asking about just navigating all the different types of guidance? For example, you know, you're talking about workers and customers and the general public. And even if we're talking about restaurants operating differently, well, you have CDC guidelines, you have ADA guidelines, you have OSHA um, compliance, right? Um, so to, to what degree does, does that seem like to be an issue or concern, just knowing how to navigate the different types and levels of guidance that people need to pay attention to, and how do we support that in any way? Sure, and that's where I think um, ideas like the uh, local voluntary self-certification program are great in trying to, to help get that to one place. Um, for now, I uh, applaud, again, the uh, county and specifically the public health department. Uh, I think that there's great updates coming to the uh, DCO public health.org website constantly. Um, and there includes some information there uh, that is generally uh, aggregates that, uh, that guidance from different places. Um, but it is difficult to um, to check the CDC website every day. I've been trying to do that for some of these industries. Um, and so I think the information the, the information is out there, um, but you're right that it is hard to, uh, to to stay updated. And so I think it's great for all of us to try to figure out how we can help do that moving forward. Um, Dr. Davis, I know that you uh, continue to meet with your roundtable, and that, and that uh, is a concern with places of worship as well, who are getting some interim guidance and updates. But uh... Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, one of the things that the places of worship roundtable has been focused on, and we're hoping to have this document of best practices slash procedures. Um, we're hoping to have that together next week. Uh, we've set a target for Wednesday. Uh, we'll hope and pray that we're able to do that. But um, what, we're, what we've been doing, everybody has been asked if you have information from your denominations, associations, uh, um, anywhere. So, and so we've developed, thanks to Ryan, a folder where we've been able to collect all of these, these things. And we're looking to develop this with probably right now two stages. So kind of your prep and then what to do before you open. And we're trying to also keep in mind that there are places of worship that have already opened. Uh, so the information can be used for them, but then also it can be used for those that will be opening. And so far we're, like I said, we're getting a lot of positive feedback and input. And so we're hoping to be able to put something together that I guess you would say has, uh, has some teeth to it, but then also um, it's, it allows people to look at it and have some direction. And so one of the things, and I'll be finished, one of the things that has come up repeatedly is how will we get this information out? Because there's so many places of worship um, that some have physical addresses, some don't. So we'll be working to kind of do something with that. We're hoping to have it on the, you know, city and county uh, sites and things to help with that. But that's something that if people will have any insight and assistance with that, once we're finished, we'll be uh, definitely needing some help there. Thank you. I was going to comment on that if I could as a great segue, um, because I know that for each of these roundtables, we might have half a dozen to several dozen people on the call. Uh, and it's a very small percentage of all of the people in that sector in the Durham economy. Um, and something that we need to be very mindful of. One of the things the communications team has done is, and is in the process of doing, is assigning uh, essentially a communications manager to each one of the round tables who has some responsibility for that group. And the um, charge for them is to go out and figure out how to communicate with all of the business owners in that sector. In some cases, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and certainly many of us as part of this task force or leaders in the community have access to some data about some of these sectors. 
but it's far from being an exhaustive way of reaching out to people. So if you all have um, additional data sources, uh, that is very helpful. We're also looking to leverage all of the social media accounts and com existing communication channels of our different organizations as much as possible. And then we've asked people to just look and try and be creative and uh, figure out some ways to get out to, to people. Um, I, I, a hairdresser, somewhere along the way, I'd gotten a um, uh, email about the protocols that one hair salon was going to follow and I sent it to my hairdresser and she was so grateful because she was really struggling with how to create something by herself. And she mentioned that she went on and forwarded it to a bunch of her friends who really appreciated having it. And it's just evidence that people are really struggling to figure out how to get to this information. And we should be thinking about each of you may have some access to some uh, particular channels that would be relevant here. And if so, please do let us know. Um, but we're going to continue to work on how we get that um, information out there. We're also looking at how we can create a centralized hub, a, a website or a landing page uh, where people can go, but you still have to point people to it. Um, just because you build a website doesn't mean everyone knows to come. So um, if everybody can be thoughtful about that, it'll be really helpful to all of us. Well, on that, I, I want to again applaud. We've got some great uh, assistance coming from the uh, public sector in what their employees are doing. Uh, for example, the uh, inspectors and uh, others in certain industries, I think, are, are being very communicative with uh, best practices when they go out. Um, but I, I think the integration of the uh, communication strategy, uh, the roundtable strategy, and the long-term uh, economic strategy will be very important moving forward. All righty. So thank you, Brian, and everyone for the updates on the roundtable. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to move us to the next item on our agenda. And I just want to say to everyone, I really appreciate all of the great work that you've done and all the great work that I know that you will continue to do over the next couple of months. It's really great to be on this task force with so many hard work and committed, engaged individuals. So many thanks to you for that. Um, the next item on our agenda relates to our priority areas. And of course, we have a whole list of priority areas, but we only have uh, agenda space to uh, cover a couple of those in any given meeting. Um, so there's a couple that we want to focus on today, um, and the first relates to economic recovery. Um, and I'm going to ask Jeff and maybe Anthony to give us a brief update on um, just uh, what's been done in that space and any support that you may currently need from the task force as a whole. Dr. Nelson, do me to start off and then I'll kick it over to you. Feel free to jump in whenever. Great. Uh, so Dr. Nelson and I had a chance to catch up on a couple of occasions uh, this week, sort of brainstorming on what, uh, what our role is, what the role of the task force is, and it's going to require uh, a lot more feedback. Am I frozen? Jesus. Am I back? Yeah, you sound much better. Then my back now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure where I. When you, you realize when you're talking and everybody else is frozen, something has gone wrong, and it's probably with me. So I think we're back now. Um, I apologize. I don't know where I where I dropped off. So I'll kind of start from the beginning. Um, so uh, through a number of our conversations, uh, we realized that the task is much uh, much more of a longer game, and it's going to require more input than just uh, the, what Dr. Nelson and I can come up with. We realize that. Um, there's probably room for some committee type work that is born from this task force. Uh, Anthony mentioned he had been talking in, in detail with, uh, with Ed Boyd for a while. I know Susan, Nicole and I have had a number of different conversations. We'd love to bring Pilar into this discussion as well. So uh, our thought was is that because it's a longer game and even though there is some economic data that's come out recently that 
this is going to be sort of a potentially a V-shaped recovery. Um, we need to be prepared to work beyond just the term of this task force. So what we're planning to do is convene this group, uh, again, born from the task force members uh, at some point next week, just to sort of start plotting out um, sort of what this recovery looks like. One of the things we discussed was the need to identify certain metrics, things like net new jobs and um, unemployment percentages, uh, but make sure that we overlay that data um, with, with racial data to make sure that we're ensuring an equitable recovery, um, as well as overlaying that data with specific uh, industry trends. I think we've all recognized that um, in all likelihood, uh, there's going to be a, there are gonna be some industries that recover quicker, and there are gonna be some industries that are slower to recover. So that's gonna require this group to start looking at things like pivoting in skill sets. Uh, maybe there's a pivot in an industry sector because um, you know, what, you're, what you're actively doing now, maybe that job's not waiting for you. I think there's a huge opportunity for us to retrain our citizens. Uh, we had a huge announcement this week with Grail uh, coming from the West Coast um, looking at 400 new jobs and $111 million worth of investment. The big fallacy there is not all of those are high level R&D. We can get those jobs filled uh, without advanced degrees. We can do them through high school, um, high school graduation, uh, as well as some training through Durham Tech. So we need to make sure that we message that to all of our communities to make sure that people realize these are accessible jobs. And I think there's a significant part of what we do as a group from an awareness standpoint throughout all of our communities to let folks know that there are opportunities waiting for them at the end of this COVID experience, certainly. So um, that's sort of where what we're looking at at this point. Uh, you guys, the, the folks that I rattled off, um, you can look for an email from, from Anthony and I trying to convene uh, coming weeks, but it's a, it's a longer game and I think we all need to be uh, recognizing the fact that um, while it's gonna be a steeper, uh, a quicker ramp up for places as fortunate as Durham, um, ultimately, I think the work is going to uh, exceed the, the, the life expectancy of this task force. Thank you for that, Jeff. And it's really good to hear that you guys are thinking strategically and you're thinking about what happens after, and I don't know how many days we have left, but after our initial 100 days, because you know, if there's work that still needs to be done, that's an offshoot of this task force. I really hope that we can figure out how do we continue to move that work along. So thanks for thinking strategically about that. And I'll turn it over to Anthony. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, Jeff pretty much summed it up. You know, it's, a, it's definitely gonna be a um, long-term uh, process. Uh, we're certainly looking at those uh, KPIs or those those metrics that are extremely important. Just as we're concerned about the physical health, um, we're we're also concerned about the economic health and which industries are uh, doing well and which in industries are not, and how can uh, we help individuals uh, move towards those industries that may be doing better, and what can we do to help industries that are not doing as well. Uh, so it's it's a matter of looking at those those metrics and you know the number of businesses that are lost, the number of businesses that that um, uh, start um, the, the net new businesses, the the revenue generated by the businesses, the unemployment rates. Um, so getting all that data to help us shine a light on uh, where the problem areas are and where the good areas are, and then looking at comparative data. As, uh, I would suspect that you know there are um, uh, uh, national averages out there that uh, we would want to compare ourselves to to find out what uh, you know how we're doing so uh, you know it's it's a matter of taking our temperature economically and finding out uh, where those rough spots are and then uh, doing something about it so but I, I think um, you know Jeff kind of hit it on the on the button in terms of um, being able to gather a group of people so that we can uh, get as much of this data as possible. All righty, thank you for that. Um, and just looking forward to that core group coming together and continuing to move um, this along. Um, the next item we have uh, um, relates to voluntary cooperation and communications, because I think in our first meeting and then subsequent meetings, there was a lot of conversations 
um, around how do we uh, have folks voluntarily comply as we move to um, continuing to open things up in Durham. So I'm gonna ask Mariel to give us an update on the voluntary self-certification tool for businesses. Great, um, happy to do that. I also um, did have a quick question for um, Dr. Nelson and, and, uh, and Jeff around, um, you know, as we are opening up, and I, this is sort of relevant on the voluntary compliance thing, you know, there are lots of businesses that now can open and are choosing not to because they still don't feel like it's safe. Um, and so I'm curious if you guys are hearing anything from those businesses that are allowed to be opening um, but are choosing not to, what are they waiting for? What's that information that they're waiting for to feel comfortable opening? And I'm wondering if that's just in the discussion at all. I would suspect that those um, types of conversations are happening in the round table. So, and I haven't really been privy to many of the round table discussions. So I'll let Jeff take that one or, or Ed even. I think Ed might be familiar with that. I'll defer to Brian. He's on all of them. I mean, uh, the ones that I've I've jumped on, I've jumped on several of them also, and I've just been hearing uh, fear and, and and not knowing when when to open. Uh, honestly, it seems like they've just been sitting back waiting to see how things go with those who do open. Yeah, I, a, I would just briefly standpoint, uh, Mariel. Um, you want to go, Brian? Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. From an office standpoint, um, many businesses are finding that. Well, first off, many of them just moved and pivoted to work remotely. And so the official opening of an office where you have somebody, you know, sitting behind a, a counter welcoming people in, um, you know, that, that's not as quite as necessary because they're realizing that, you know, maybe you can roll that back a little bit slower. Certainly, I think probably from a from a restaurant standpoint and a retail standpoint where there's a lot of that, uh, that most closer contact um, and prolonged contact. Um, there is an element of fear. When I've listened into a few of those uh, those conversations, um, that's sort of what I'm getting is some of that level of apprehension, um, and also that it's not necessarily a terribly a, a you know you know the, the thing about going out to a, a restaurant or experiencing retail. It's very very it's personal and it's supposed to be escapism, and um, we are reminded of the difficult times we're in when we go to certain places and everybody's wearing masks and staying separated. And so um, there's a reluctance, I think, from the consumer to engage in that level of, of, of activity as, as well. So I think that that's sort of where people are sort of slowly testing the waters. Um, the administrative side of like a lot of our larger corporations in our lab work, um, they are still functionally being able to manage that remotely. Um, and so I think that this is kind of a kind of a, uh, a balance there between uh, personal uh, personal safety, um, the ability to still be productive, and we also have to remember that you know many of our workers are uh, have children, school age children, and many of them are still trying to you know finish up homeschooling or figure out what the camps or situation is going to be like, and it's hard to physically dive right back into the office. And I think employers are taking that into consideration as well. Just that's all anecdotal um, and based on conversations, nothing, no, no, no statistics there necessarily. Yeah, and I, I just quickly note, I think um, there is a combination of uh, consumer confidence, uh, employee confidence, and um, some of the relief programs uh, that are out there are still, you know, very actively supporting some of the uh, employees and, and the short-term needs there. And so as we, um, get to see what, what's going on in uh, other parts of the country, other parts of the state. Um, I do think that uh, there's a lot that are recognizing that uh, even as they uh, reopen, it may be at a, a limited capacity. Uh, for example, I think some plenty of restaurants are choosing to continue to do just curbside and delivery only right now. Um, but it, it'll be, uh, I, I think we're, figuring out how to move from the short term into whatever the medium term looks like. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, so I'll give a quick update on the, um, the checklist uh, assessment self, um, you know, self assessment tool. And um, so we now have uh, draft versions for a wide variety of different types of businesses. Um, that includes uh, restaurants, personal services, gyms, uh, event venues, hotels, hotels with gyms, hotels with restaurants, hotels with pools, um, other type uh, hotels that don't have those. Um, 
grocery, retail, uh, and places of worship. Um, and we have, uh, this week, we got great feedback um, from uh, several folks on this call uh, who uh, previewed the tool and um, particularly Dr. Akinboyo and uh, and Director Jenkins and uh, also Katie, of course. Uh, and so it's very, very helpful. We are incorporating that feedback now, uh, going through and making revisions. And we uh, very much hope to be able to send each of those tailored checklists to each of the roundtables um, because we think that that's a really important uh, next step is to make sure that we're getting their input as well to, uh, to just, does it make intuitive sense about how it works? Um, is it, does it feel like it's relevant and speaks to their own you know, business or organization? Um, and, and so that's sort of that very next step. Uh, in addition, of course, we have to think about where this lives. Uh, it's a digital experience. And so we've been working with McKinney in uh, sort of creating the, the wraparound um, experience with the tool. Uh, that includes, um, of course, a, a website landing page for it. And, um, and so just actually last night, they presented out the wireframes and, and website designs and some of the, the templates uh, for materials. Um, we are giving them some feedback and also um, Tilde, which is the uh, language justice uh, organization that the city is working with to make sure that also the materials are uh, relevant and accessible to our Spanish speaking population. Um, so they are also reviewing all the materials to make sure that it will also, uh, just to, to give that feedback to make sure that it resonates with those populations and that it'll be easily, it, it, it will be something that can translate uh, into other languages. And so um, we are sending that feedback back to uh, McKinney to make some uh, additional changes, tweaks. Um, we're hoping to have all of that finalized early next week. The developer for the website is also already looped in, has materials, is sort of um, exploring right now technicalities, uh, but feels like everything's going to be totally doable. Um, and so we are, uh, obviously, we we wish this could have been done weeks ago. Uh, we know that that would have been beneficial, but uh, we're all working as, as fast as we can. Um, but I wanted to give a, an opportunity for questions. I know that we've talked a lot about this um, and you know, not everybody has had a chance to see it yet, um, but, I, but, but I did wanna to answer, uh, yeah, answer some questions. And um, I, I, just, I also wanna note, you know, what a, you know we're, we're working as hard as we can. Um, the, and, and you know, the, the center, of course, we're, we're donating our time and effort to this. Uh, and additionally, McKinney also donated their time and effort to it. So um, we're lucky and, and happy to be able to, to provide that back to the city and the county. Thanks so much, Marielle. Um, lots of great work. And as I, I think I heard Susan make the comment about, she shared information with the hair, her hairdresser that she'd gotten from another, and that's kind of cascaded. My hope is that this, these checklists will really enable um, a wide variety of businesses to feel comfortable opening uh, without having to do all the homework themselves. Um, so really great work here. Um, any questions for Marielle before I turn it over to Susan to talk a little bit about the communications team? And just to just to emphasize that that point, Matisha, is that um, you know this is something that we have seen is that we've seen some businesses that are very very good at this, right? So some businesses are already doing all of these things that are on the checklist, um, and then there are and, and so this will feel like a redundant exercise for them, right? And and we acknowledge that and understand it which is why we're trying to keep it, you know, pretty streamlined and fairly easy to move through. Um, but this is exactly for those businesses like the hairdresser that is like, I don't have a huge team behind me to figure out how's the right way to do this. Um, and so really trying to take those best practices that a lot of businesses are doing um, and help share those easily, uh, digestibly um, and actionably with, uh, with other businesses that just don't have that same sort of level of resources that some of the, the different organizations have. And, and of course, and of course the, the other major component getting back to this idea of how do we build up that consumer confidence is that it has a front facing component for, for consumers to get visibility and sort of commitment around what um, different businesses are doing. And I would note that something that McKinney also brought to the lens is making sure that there's also a lot of language tied in about the things that residents also need to be doing. Um, because one of the things that we uh, heard 
um, from Brian and, and other folks who joined a sort of multi-sector roundtable for us to listen in on and ask questions, uh, is that you know a lot of businesses aren't just concerned about their ability, and actually many are less concerned about their ability to, to you know keep the space uh, the way it needs to be and keep their staff doing the things that they need to do, but how do they control the customers that come in and, and aren't social distancing and aren't wearing masks? And, um, and so we're also, uh, that's been a, a nice additional ad is really focusing on the customer confidence that they can trust that this business is doing things, but also some really clear messaging and focus on the, the responsibilities that, that residents also have to, to make sure that Durham is opening in a way that, can, that it can stay open. Great. Thanks, Mariel. Thanks so much for that. Looks like Mayor Shul has a comment. Thanks, Matisha. Just a question. Uh, but for, yeah, first of all, wow, this is awesome. We, I'm so excited. And I think this is the first time that we've had the reveal about McKinney uh, being involved uh, with the design and they have been donating their uh, services. And I'm really excited about the combination of having the Center for Advanced Hindsight's thinking and the McKinney's uh, expertise in communication. It's fabulous. Um, so my question involves the last thing that you were talking about. I was thinking about this after you do the work on the checklist for the businesses. I wonder is there is some similar kind of confidence building measures, um, a checklist for customers or consumers, you know, that our community people would themselves sign on to Mariel. You know, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with this, but where there is a similar kind of checklist that, you know, these are the things as I'm, I pledge to be a good customer, a good consumer, a good, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I just wondered if, if you all have been thinking also uh, about that as a, as a kind of next step. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, we've thought a lot about how different folks can demonstrate their commitment um, beyond just the you know, just the, the taking a pledge or, or something. Um, you know, we do think that like having a, the commitment and the pledge is really helpful. We know that that's something that Count on Me has incorporated is this guest pledge. So we want to you know think about how we would integrate with that rather than just sort of duplicate it perhaps. Um, but we've thought a lot about. We know the real importance part of not of just acknowledging for yourself that you're doing this, but ways to signal to other people um, that you're doing this because that helps really create a social norm that this is this is what we do in Durham, of course. This is, we follow these things and, and by broadcasting that and showing that, which we think is a really uh, important component, it helps um, really uh, to some of Pilar's earlier points, it helps um, reduce the stigma about wearing masks. It helps because it emphasizes the fact that this is something everyone is doing and it, and it it makes people feel sort of less awkward and weird when they're the only ones who are adhering to these. Um, so it's really, so, so we're also thinking about how do we demonstrate and show that in different ways. Um, but great point about, you know, making sure we, we figure out ways to incorporate the Count on ENC guest pledge if, if that feels um, relevant and appropriate. Thank, thank you, Mariel. Go ahead, Susan. Yeah, no, I know you guys are, uh... Um, still working out some final details on graphics and uh, the, the concepting work with McKinney, um, but you all will bring it to this group when it's ready. Um, I think that'll be great for everybody to see and understand what that messaging is. Do you, do you know what your timeline is for that, right? Um, that's a great, so we are providing, we're trying to provide feedback. So we got the, the presentation from McKinney uh, last night and we are trying to provide feedback to them uh, by end of day today, and we expect they'll be making those revisions um, on, I would say, Monday or Tuesday, um, and, and expanding that out. And then, um, and I know that we are also getting the input from from uh, Teal Day today as well. So uh, we would assume it'll be, um, I would say, by mid midweek next week. Great. Well, I, from a communications team standpoint. Um, the heart of what is this group is communicating is what Mariel's just talked about. We're very excited to see this work come forward and to have the kind of content that they're creating. Uh, and that sets the stage for a lot of other things to have the graphics and some of the key messaging concepts come together. So I'm um, really happy to see all that work. 
Um, we're also very appreciative. This great week for communications. We're appreciative that we've had a few very much on the last journey. Yeah, we're having a hard time here. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't. Okay, that's better. Okay, I can hear you all fine. <laughs> um, so uh, we've had it was a good week for communications. We've had new volunteers join the group, which is helpful, especially since our number of roundtables has been expanding, and we want to make sure that we have people dedicated to each uh, roundtable to make sure that we are communicating out to each one of those uh, business sectors um, and very pleased that we've got Tilde on board to uh, help with the translation work. Um, so we talked a, a lot about the main pieces of um, creating that communication and finding ways to get it out into the community. Uh, and so that works underway. We're also, the communications team is also working on a longer term plan to look for what are the kinds of trigger events that would mean that we need additional communication. So when we move to a new phase, if there were an uptick and we needed to make some correction on our reopening plans. Um, so the team is planning for those kinds of possibilities um, and, and how that information goes out. Uh, so uh, there's just a lot of, um, effort going on now to plan out all of the components of this and start to push this messaging out of all these uh, the graphics and, and checklists and things ready to go. All right, excellent. Lots of great work. Um, so with three minutes left, um, I'm going to can I add one more quick comment? Mm -hmm. I just want to add a quick appreciation of Susan and the communications team. They have been bootstrapping this thing. They've gotten volunteers and from the various organizations. Susan's been doing a great job leading it. And I just really am grateful because they've done a lot and it's been super important. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, but just wanted to get that in. Well, I appreciate no. that. Thank you. Uh, and, and I need to give a head uh, appreciation to Margaret Pentrack, who's really been uh, leading this on an every day, every week basis. Thank you, thank you. Um, so with three minutes left on the agenda, I'm going to close this out unless there's something that, that's pressing on anyone's mind that you want to cover in the last two minutes that we have. Um, so I just want to open the floor up for that. So anything that's really pressing on anyone's mind that you don't think we gave any justice to today that you want to bring to the task force attention? If I could just one minute, Matisha. Uh, just I, one. I, yeah, just <laughs> one. I just wanted to say, literally, I've just been sitting here thinking about it. As we engage in the work that we're all doing, I, I don't, I don't want it to fall short that there, there are those of us uh, that are. This is, this is being done over a, ter a terrain of, 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 of implicit bias, racism, and etc. And black women in this country have have bared the responsibility or the burden of being uh, what we call the double minority, right? Um, and I just think that some acknowledgement publicly should be made today from every one of us, you know, whether it's just checking on a, a black woman that you know, or just uplifting her, praying for her, or whatever the case may be. I just, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that while we're all truly in this together, there are those of us that are kind of bearing the burden of this uh, uh, in a different way and have, and have continued to do so for years. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ed. I really appreciate you sharing um, those thoughts and I ask that you do just what Ed said. Um, I think it would be greatly appreciated. All right. Well, it looks like we're at 9.59, so with the last minute left, again, many thanks to all the great work that everyone continues to do. Um, I've just been amazed at how much we've done, and I think I saw Ryan say we have 79 days left, which means we've been working together collectively as a task force for about 20 days, and as I think about the things that we've done over the past 20 days, it truly blows my mind. And as I think about the next 80 days that we have before us, or 79 days, um, I know that we're going to continue to do great things at the task force. So many thanks to all of you, and I hope all of you have a great weekend, and looking forward to our next meeting on next Friday. Everyone take care. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you.